<laughs> so, are we on the air? Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. Oh, it's such an honor and a joy to have you on because, as I told you in the email, you know, that um, the character of Simone has been very inspiring to me, and I just feel so thrilled that you took the time today. Well, of course, of course. It's, you know, Tommy, it's my favorite role I've ever played in a film. Mm-hmm. And it's my favorite movie I've ever done. And I love theater. I come from theater, and I've done some really... Um, really, I love some of the, the TV things I've done, like Carnival and, and the Incredible Witch part I played on Civil Wars years ago, <laughs> a Bochco show. Yeah. I have to say, of all the movies, I love Pee Wee's Big Adventure the most. Oh, that's great. And great. I think it's Tim Burton's, I think it's his, one of his best, if not his best movie. I agree with you. It is certainly... A unique film and it's also a powerhouse debut for him yeah yeah really <laughs> he had done one other movie called Frankie and Weenie only and he arranged a private screening on uh, Warner Brothers lot for me and for um, Elizabeth e. G. Daly Elizabeth Daly yeah who played uh, Dottie in Pee Wee's right. Big Adventure and we watched uh, Frankie and Weenie about two dogs it's, it's um it's a spoof on Frankenstein. Yeah, I, I mean, he, I saw it. He's, he's just extraordinary. Have you seen Frankie and Weenie? Frank and Weenie, yeah, I, I saw it years ago. Yeah, it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I, I worked with Tim Burton. I not Tim. Well, I worked with Tim on Batman Returns as well with uh, Paul Rubens, who played Pee Wee, of course. But I recently. Oh, I guess about two years ago, I had um, I had the great pleasure of working with Paul Rubens a third time on Pee Wee's Big Holiday. Yeah. On Netflix, mm -hmm. and it was a very very different character. It was Catherine Hepburn in a flying car. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> did you see that? Yes, I sure did. <laughs> oh my goodness! Great. This is great. So, Tommy, just ask me some questions, you know. Uh, I, I'm here to just divulge. <laughs> okay. So, at what age did you decide that you were that you were uh, inter interested in acting? Well, I, it started when I was five, actually. And um, my mother went into the hospital, and my father started playing all these. He was doing it before that, but... He really, um, he, you know, he would put on all these musicals at the time, and my favorite was My Fair Lady, but Oklahoma, but South Pacific. And, you know, I would sing and dance for him. Mm -hmm. And that's really how I began acting. And, uh, you know, those, those, those musicals are just, they're, they're incredible. Just incredible. And, uh, you know, I still, I'm still very touched by those, those songs. Just amazing, like on the street where you live, and right. My Fair Lady, and Show Me, and Camelot. You know, where are the simple joys of maidenhood? I mean, they're also <laughs> they're fabulous, and probably the viewers or the, the people listening to this don't even know these musicals, but they were incredible, and that's how I really got got started. But as I was growing up, I went to a Catholic girl all girls school that Grace Kelly had gone to, mm -hmm. and. And um, I wanted to be, you tell me when I was growing up, I wanted to be a nun, an, act, an, an astronaut, or an actress. <laughs> and I think becoming an actress, they're all about transcending, and in very, very different ways. And um, uh, I wound up being an actress, and that kind of can encompass anything, you know, including an astronaut or, or, <laughs> or a nun. It, it's... Uh, it's been a it's been an amazing ride. <laughs> I mm -hmm. feel right now that I, I I'm not giving up acting by any stretch of the imagination, but I really I love writing, and it's it's another aspect of storytelling where you get to be everybody. Of course. That's the amazing thing is that when you're writing, you get to be everyone in the story. Right. And I was talking to Gary Oldman. Um, in, a, in a reception for him after we saw um, uh, 
the, the, the Churchill movie, which he won the Academy Award for this year, and I told him he was going to win. And, um, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm magnificent. I'm writing this, I'm writing this novel. And uh, it's going to, I know it's going to get made into a screen, it's, uh, into a movie. And I told him a little bit about it. And I said, you know, I just love writing it. He said, yes, he felt the same way. And he kind of whispered in my ear so no one else could hear. But, so I shouldn't really repeat what he said. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like after a certain point with acting, this is what he was talking about. You know, you, you want to have, you want to tell the whole story, not just a piece of the story, right. you know? Right. Those are not his words, they're mine. But it's, it's about, I don't know, you kind of mature and uh, you, you, you evolve and you, you want to, uh, uh, you want to, you know, you just want to tell the whole thing. You want, you want to be the whole thing, not just the piece. And you want to have more control over it, of the stories you tell. And you get to do that as a, as a the writer. So I, I love acting still. I come from theater and I, I love theater very much. And I love Shakespeare the most of all. And, um, you know, but there, there are not that many rules for women, um, even in Shakespeare, that are, you know, I'd love to still play Lady Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, I yeah. can play one of the witches at this point. <laughs> I love playing Lady Macbeth, and there, there are some roles that I, you know, I can't really play right now, but uh, I love them. And, but as a writer, you get to be them. It doesn't yeah. matter how how old and how young, and what if, regardless of the sex, it's it's really fabulous whether you're a man or woman. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, it's a it's a great joy to be a storyteller. I find it it's a huge honor. I'm and I want to do this until the day I die. That's just wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, I was also raised Catholic. Yo, <laughs> are you recovering? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But who who are some of uh, your influences? Well, for acting, I mean, and for life, I don't really separate them. Um, well, I've had played Catherine Hepburn now, but she is certainly one of my inspirations. And the other one is Auntie May, the Rosalind Russell um, mm -hmm. character, the one, the first one, the Auntie May, the original one. I love that character, and I, that's one of my goals is to become anti-mame. I think I already am becoming that. <laughs> I, I love, uh, you know, when she says life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a good I, quote. I, I, as, I, as, I'm, as I'm growing younger, I take life less, less seriously. I just adore anti-mame. Yeah. So she's a huge influence, and Vanessa Redgrave is my favorite living actress. I, you know, I just, I've met her a couple of times, and she said I reminded her of one of her daughters, and now that daughter has passed, um, Natasha Richardson. But um, I love Vanessa Redgrave. I think she is just extraordinary. And, um, but I love, I love, I love movies from all different times and all different cultures. I just saw at the French Film Festival last night a co-production between China and France mm -hmm. um, called The Lady in the Portrait. And the, the lead is this huge star in China I'd never seen before named Bin Bin. And she's remarkable. Mm -hmm. And... Um, who are my influences? I, I mean, the best Joan of Arc movie, I'm writing a novel about, about Joan of Arc, and the best Joan of Arc movie um, was made in 1928 by uh, a Scandinavian director named Carl Dreyer, and it's the best one of all. And then when you look at Emma Gonzalez, you know, who was, uh, who was one of the uh, students in, in the Florida um, shootout, the most recent high school shootout, and how she's a, she's a kind of Joan of Arc, and they, that's so. 
I'm so excited to see that Joan of Arc live through all these young women right. who are, you know, really taking the bull by the horns and 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 stopping gun violence, stopping violence, you know, stopping the um, what's the word for it? Just the imperialism, you know, whether it's the you know the English in France and France six hundred years ago or. I, I, these kids are remarkable. I'm so proud of them. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud. And they're really going to make a difference. They're really going to change things. Mm -hmm. And I love the way Emma Gonzalez went up against the head of the NRA and said to this yeah. woman, you know, I'm caring more for your children than you are. I, I, it's just, it's, she's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So these are my inspirations. <laughs> Nice. And I'd say the biggest one at this point is Joan of Arc, and, and I'm writing about her, and I've got a modern girl who's obsessed by her. Nice. So, so, um, yeah, so to talk more, to ask me more questions. So, so what year did uh, you move to L.A.? Um, I came here, I've been here twice. I came here the first time because... I said to my agent, who's no longer an agent, he got smart and started uh, traveling around the world with his lover in a boat. <laughs> but um, before he gave up agenting, he was my agent. I adored him, John, John Comerford. And um, I, I said, he said, you've got to go west. You have to go to L.A. And I said, but, oh, no, I want to be a great actor. I want to, I want to exercise my muscles and do Broadway, and he said, Diane, the gym is closed, go west, go to LA. So I came out, I was I think 30 years old, and, and I, I helped my mother die, and mm -hmm. then as soon as she died, I took her car and I drove out uh, to LA. And I had, uh, uh, my sister was visiting her boyfriend, and now a longtime husband, uh, his family in um, uh, just north of just north of LA, and um, I stayed with them. I had no place to stay when I first came out here, and it was about an hour away from L LA. And um, and then and I already had an agency here mm -hmm. because I had they were connected to the agents I had in uh, New York City, right. and I started in. I got Pee Wee's, and my first movie was Creature, right. and I, it was my first movie audition, and I was determined to get it, and I got it. And with Klaus Kinski, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask about that. <laughs> and then I, I can't really repeat some of the stuff he said to me, because uh, it's just too rude. I had never been spoken to like this in my life. Yeah, and I went to all girls schools all my life, and went to Barnard, the women's part of Columbia University, and and I was very sheltered, you know. Even at that age, I I um, had a couple boyfriends, but not many, and I was yeah. devoted to acting. It was my temple. Theater was my temple, and I came out here in that first movie with Klaus Kinski, and you know I can't repeat on the air what he said because it was so out outrageously lewd outrageous yeah yeah i had um and go, oh, go, mm -hmm. ahead. go on i had tony mcclure on who worked with him a year later in crawl space and she uh the whole episode turned into an episode about her me too experiences and that was the first one she told me about i just could not believe it i mean i knew he was very difficult to work with but i was like wow that is just oh my god i couldn't believe what a monster he yeah. was well i don't think of him as a monster i've had i mean almost all women in our business have had some kind of me too experience but mm -hmm. um you know you, you, i just call you know, i didn't call him on it i literally picked him up i was wearing <laughs> i'm i was i'm 511 yeah i was wearing these 1920s police riding boots Mm -hmm. and the heel was maybe two inches tall, so I was over six feet, and he came up to about my breast level, which mm -hmm. is a little unfortunate <laughs> in this case, but, you know, when he would pull this stuff, um, I just, 
I remember he, I was lying on an operating table in and the uh, and uh, one of the sets that wasn't being used at the, that point in an operating room on the on the spaceship, and we were in quilted space gear. Uh, you know, it was a low budget movie. We were in quilted space suits. And there, we were shooting in the valley, and it was about 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. And they were pumping air in with these kind of big yellow caterpillar-like type air ducts. But it was so um, hot, and we couldn't get out of the spacesuit because you, you, you could be called at a minute's notice. And I was mm -hmm. lying on this table, and he jumped on top of me. I'm not going to tell you the verbal stuff he said, but he jumped on top of me, and mm -hmm. I pushed him off. And then I got up, and I was towering over him, and I literally picked him up. Mm -hmm. And he was a little man, and I picked him up, and I just juggled him like you would a baby. Mm -hmm. And I put him down. And I, I didn't want to get, it was my first movie, and I didn't want to get fired. I didn't say anything to anybody. But I kept, uh, you know, doing things like this to kind of diffuse the whole thing. Right. And, you know, keep his pecker down. <laughs> 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 so so that's, that's what I did. And, uh, you know, it makes for some good stories. I usually only tell women because it's so rude. I, you, you, it was just staggering. But I never told anybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the first day I came, I had read in a book the day before, I, or the day I was going to meet Klaus at the director's house, uh, before we started shooting, because I was his love interest in this. And, yeah. and um, Bill, what was his name? The, the director, oh, his name was Bill. I just, his name is escaping me at the moment, the last name. But anyway, Bill told me that um, James Cameron, you know, took the idea of mm -hmm. the Sigourney Weaver character from our movie, right? And uh, you know, and made it into Aliens and uh, Alien, Aliens, bo both of them. And um, I guess it's just called Aliens. So he made it into Alien and took this this whole character and you know who was protecting the ship with this huge gun, this woman. Right. And um, he based it on my character, and he was very proud of it, which I found kind of ex extraordinary that he was proud of this because you'd think he would be pissed that he had taken this character, but he wasn't, didn't seem to be at all. Right. But anyway, I met Klaus at his house the day before we started shooting, and I was his love interest. And I had just read that... Um, you know that, or heard. You know that he had. He was. He was just. He did this really lewd. I mean, beyond lewd, in a love scene in the movie right before he did our movie. Right. And uh, I'm not going to go into it, but it, you just. You know, it was the worst you can imagine. Right. And um, right. and also that he he wrote in his book, his memoir, that he had his own daughter, oh Natasha. Kinski before um, Polanski did. Oh my God, that's just disgusting. And that was in his memoir. He's bragging about this. Can you imagine? And and so when I met him, I, I you know I I was wearing as butchy outfit as I could. Right. And I walked I walked into the house, and he comes up to me, and he. He, he, you know, he, he want, he's like all of a sudden lured, lunges for me to kiss me on the mouth, and I turned my cheek. And then he pulled back and he looked at my whole body and went, ah, yes, he's very, she's very sexy. Ah, yes, she's very sexy. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's how it started. And I wasn't there the first day. I think I was there the second day was my call. And I was sitting in the... Um, the makeup uh, chair, and this the makeup artist said that Krinsky had been in the day before, right. and had when she was bending over him to put on um, his makeup, he grabbed her breast. Oh God! I just, but it it, it it just went on and on and on like this, and oh it wasn't just the women on the set; it was also like the uh, 
the cameraman, I remember his name was Matthias, was his last name. He was great. And um, the cameraman would, would, would be telling him, you know, okay, hit this mark, hit this mark. They put, you know, they put the marks down on the floor. And Kinski would pay no attention to it. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm the actor, you follow me. And as a result, um, you know, Bill couldn't, Bill Malone is the director's name. And as a result, Bill Malone couldn't use a lot of the takes because he was out of focus. Uh-huh. And it was, it was all about him, you know? It was yeah. completely about him. And, uh, <laughs> but he, he gave me a great acting lesson. And that was uh, Kinski taught me how to act with your back because <laughs> the camera was behind me and we were out in space <laughs> and the sound stage with all these styrofoam stones right. and uh, dark lights. And I had the space helmet on, of course. And he taught me how to act. And my back was to the camera and, and he taught me how to act with my back. And I've used it a couple of times. Where, the, the, you know, even if the audience on stage or, or the camera is behind you, it's very, very powerful. He was, a, he was really quite, he was brilliant. He yeah. was brilliant, but completely, Insane. Uh, you know, such a, in, 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 another way of looking at it, he would have thought of himself as a free spirit. Yeah. <laughs> but it, he had no regard for what he did to women or or. You know, the cameraman. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember that they were, Bill told me that they were trying to um, contact him. I think about starting earlier or changing the start date. And he lived outside of uh, San Francisco in a house with no electricity and no, um, it was really extraordinary, no electricity and no mm. phone, and we cell phones hadn't been invented yet. This was back in the um, 80s, right? like 85, or 80, 85, I think I came out the first time to L.A., and right. he, they couldn't reach him. They had to send a telegram wow. because there was no way of reaching him, and he, he didn't have, he told, Kinski told me that he didn't have a bed mm-hmm. in this cabin. He just lay on straw or something. Mm-hmm. He's, I mean, really extraordinary, extraordinary human being. And um, I never took the sexual stuff too seriously at all. I just diffused it, we, mm-hmm. whether verbally or picking him up like a child, as I said. Yeah. So that was my initiation into Hollywood. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> my, well... Uh, my parents brought me up to be a, a gentleman and respect women, and just when I hear stories like I that, I can tell from your voice. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it just it just breaks and my heart. So when what, I hear. what's extraordinary is that the power of women is, you know, um, it's 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 in the unconscious, and that is far more powerful than the conscious mind, which has been highly developed, especially by in the patriarchal society. Right. And uh, but women, their domain is in the unconscious. Which and if you compare the conscious with the unconscious, the conscious is like uh, you know the tip of the iceberg that's showing outside of the waves, above the waves. And when you go underneath, it's like a continent under there. The iceberg is much much bigger underneath the water. And that that's like a great metaphor for the unconscious, the conscious and the unconscious. Yeah. So, you know, women are, women are, uh, I'm so happy to be a woman in this time. I'm so happy, at, or any time. I, I think that women have phenomenal power, but it's, as I said, a lot of it has been in the unconscious, and now it's being made conscious. Yeah. So it's extraordinary. Yes. And um, women, I, I, I see an Indian saint who comes once a year, and she is, uh, her name is Karuna Mai. She's also known as Amma. She's not the hugging Amma, but she's this other Amma, which means mother in Hindu. Mm-hmm. And um, she says that, you know, men need women, but women do not need men. And I think that's true. 
I think that's true. Yes. And we're 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 very women are can be very content being on our own mm -hmm. because we're so connected to the earth and the moon and uh, you know we 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 feel connect a connection to everything that I think men need a woman to feel. Yeah, and women need the conduit. Men need the conduit to feel it with a woman. But we have a direct source for it. And I'm not saying that there are some men who do have that direct connection to the, the source, the earth. But, you know, it, but women have innately, you know, because they give birth, whether you ever give birth or not. We give birth. Right. We, we're the continuum for life. We're the, we're the tunnel. We're the channel that life flows through in a way that men do not have. And um, it's it's marvelous. What's I mean? I I'm of two minds about this whole Me Too thing. I think it's a witch hunt as well. Yeah. And uh, I think there's going to be a huge backlash from very patriarchal men from this. But um, it's it's marvelous that this is coming out. But I also feel very sorry for some of the victims uh, who are the victims now, the men who are being attacked like this because. In most cases, their whole careers are, are over. Yeah. And, you know, when a man does this kind of thing, it, it's dam they're damaged. I don't believe in capital punishment either. Yeah. And, um, you know, it needs to be addressed, the damage that they went through. Right. And when you study somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer, who murdered particularly young boys and would eat them, yeah. who's one of the biggest, you know, most terrific serial killers, and, and I read the FBI testimony, which is a, uh, that he gave to the FBI when he was caught in, and, and in prison. It was 50 pages long, and he talked about being abandoned, horribly abandoned by his mother and father, and left abandoned in, in this house with only a refrigerator. And the father went off, and then the mother took the uh, younger sister and he was left alone. And right. so he would get, kill these boys and eat them as a way to keep them with him longer. Right. Because they'd be in him, you know, and go, uh, it, it's horrific. But at the same time, you know, you need to, our, our society is um, very wham, bam, thank you, man. You know, yeah. when I was at Barnard, at, at, there was a, at Columbia, a guy wrote a paper on the, our society called the Toilet Society, where you just flush everything down the toilet. Yeah. You know, divorce, whatever, you know, abortion. You know, you flush everything down the toilet. Ah, there it's go. Okay, gone, gone, next. You know, bigger, bigger, higher, higher, more, more. And it's pathetic. Mm -hmm. Because we need to really heal these men, and and uh, you know, it, it's good it's coming out, but you also have to heal these men and heal young men too, so that they don't they don't behave like this. This is endemic of of our society and our our, our world right now, our civilization, it's, and it needs to be addressed on a far deeper level than to just scandalize them, you know, and, and, and destroy them in terms of their work. And I do think that it, you know, it, it's good that it's happening, but it's also a witch hunt. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, and my heart goes out to the, these men as well, as along with the victims. It's become a cultural impact. Uh, that's for sure. Um, so, uh, this so Pee Wee's Big Adventure. This is where I fell in love with you because she's such a kind and compassionate character. But how did you uh, get Thank this you. role? Well, I, I approached it from the idea of the dream, and I only had like forty-five minutes to prepare. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't given the script until I got to Warner Brothers, and I went into the bathroom and in the stall. And my first line was, do you have any dreams? And um, um, I just worked in terms of, I've been with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival um, for nine months, and 
there was a, these this beautiful beautiful hills mountains kind of um, uh, that you over that uh, you know you look out on at, from the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and right. they were when summer came it was just they turned this because all the the um, the grass just was burnt and so it looked gold in the in the dying sunset and I. And I thought to myself, I would, I want to do this. I want to create something as marvelous as this. Mm -hmm. that, that God or the force, whatever you want to call it, nature, Mother Nature has created. I, I want to create something as beautiful and magnificent as this. And, and so here I am telling you an acting secret. <laughs> anyway, I, I, you know, I worked with imagery from, from that. Um, as preparation and uh, for do you have any dreams and right. my dream is to live in the city of eternal love Paris France and I it's funny that I'm I go back to France now um, I went there three years ago I went last summer and I'm going back probably in the fall Nice. to continue my research for my Joan of Arc project. So I'm still really connected to Paris, France. <laughs> and beautiful. Joan of Arc never got the city walls at that time, but they have a plaque up where she was wounded in the thigh. And she stayed for several days there, and the, you know, the walls were impenetrable. And they couldn't get into France, to Paris, to liberate um the uh, to, to city from the English, but and then the uh, Dauphin, whom she had put on the throne, and he was now Charles the Seventh. She, yeah. you know, he called, he pulled all her troops. Right. It was horrific. It was just horrific, and so she got mercenaries to to keep going with her until she was captured in Compiègne. So she never made it into Paris, but I, I go to Paris a lot, and then I go, I, the first time I went to do research three summers ago, mm -hmm. I went to 35 towns and villages in um, six and a half weeks that Joan of Arc had been to. Right. Six and a half weeks for 35 towns and villages. Mm -hmm. And she went to 79 in a year and a half by horseback. That's extraordinary. And they didn't fight in wintertime. So you take out, and you know, France is so cold for so long. It's not like, it's not like LA at all, where it gets down to maybe 50 yeah. for uh, possibly a month. You know, it's freezing, freezing. And they wouldn't, <laughs> um, you know, they didn't, they didn't fight for those months. So when you consider how many towns, 35, Tommy. Yeah. 30, I mean, 79, 79 towns and villages. Right. By horseback. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, you know, you know, I'm absolutely passionate about this. I'm, I'm passionate. And, and I've always been obsessed by Joan of Arc. And when I first moved out here, my, my agent, one of my agents at STE, which became Paradigm, it's now Paradigm, and my age, one of my agents said to me, um, what roles do you see yourself doing? What roles would you like to play? And I said, Joan of Arc. And he <laughs> burst out laughing. And, I, and I, I looked at him kind of astounded that he would laugh at this. But that's the nature of L.A. You know, there's very little period stuff. Yeah. And um, certainly not from that period. <laughs> when, um, you know, for. Joan died in 1431, and Christopher Columbus came in 1492. Right. So, you know, <laughs> America hadn't even been been really discovered yet by by the Caucasians. And mm -hmm. although Cortez was earlier in in Mexico, yeah. but um, you know, it, it, it just he just laughed, and I said, "Well, I said Joan of Arc's equivalent in modern day." Like uh, Julia, you know, the, where Vanessa Redgrave won the Academy Award. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Julia is another one there. And, you know, the Hunger Games, that character is um, Jennifer Lawrence's character, is um, 
is a Joan of Arc. Yeah. And so is Wonder Woman. You know, it's really, it's like coming full circle. And we're seeing a lot of these Joan of Arc, not only in movies, but as I said, in, in Emma Gonzalez. And uh, I, I, it's, it's thrilling. It's absolutely thrilling. So I'm, I'm so excited to be writing this. This is, this is my passion at this point. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Paul Rubens originally wanted uh, his friend Terry uh, Bolo to play uh, Simone, and uh, she ended up playing the blonde-haired uh, biker girl, and I'm going to be actually interviewing her later today. Uh-huh, and what is, t tell me her name? Uh, Terry Bolo. Huh, you know, I don't think I've met her. Yeah, she was in the Groundlings with Paul. Oh, that's great. I had no idea. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Huh. And a, she, played, she played the biker, the main biker woman in the bar with uh, Tequila, the dad, Tequila. She, yeah, she, she was the blonde-haired one. Cassandra Peterson, who's known for playing Elvira, was the oh, other she's one. brilliant. That's yeah. brilliant. And I've done another movie with her. Mm -hmm. She's just, she's wonderful. Oh. Yeah, I've almost well, met her uh, a couple times. Yeah. Yes. Well, and then you know, Paul. Paul uh -huh. um, initially didn't want anyone from any of the Pee Wee movies to. Um, I don't know that I should. You don't put this part in. <laughs> <laughs> Cut this part out. But uh, Paul didn't want any of uh, the the actors from the Pee Wee movies to be in Pee Wee's Big Holiday on Netflix. And then I came in and auditioned for it, and uh, mm -hmm. a second time with him in the room and the director, and he said, you know, you were born to play this, and everybody wants you, yeah. um, he, except for him, because he didn't, and he tells me this <laughs> in the audition, because he, he didn't want anyone from the other movies. And then when they cast me, they then put, um, I think five of us were in, from uh, from from diff from the, the different Pee Wee movies, he put five of us in. But initially, it was you know that he he didn't. But he said, "You're so perfect for this as Catherine Hepburn." And I said, "Yes." I, and I had had a dream years ago that I would play Catherine Hepburn, and here I was playing her. It was fantastic. Yeah. We have to pay more attention to the unconscious and to our dreams, mm -hmm. much much more. And I think that. Um, because they're also warning dreams. And when you're off kilter, or you're off your center, or you're off who you are, uh, your dreams warn you. They're really, yeah. uh, the, the dream life is far more important than this physical world is. Yeah. And, you know, Carl Jung, the, uh, the great Jungian psychologist, said that, um, what did he say? It was really extraordinary about um, about this. Something about that you dream, mm -hmm. you awake. I, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's really amazing that that only when you dream are you really awake. The dream life, mm -hmm. and that you dream to awake. Just extraordinary. So that's what I want to do in my writing. You know, is to mm -hmm. to. Uh, to open the unconscious up more to people than they are, allow themselves to uh, to open to in regular life. I want to open that up much more. And other directors, other writers, other filmmakers have done this in the past, like David Lynch mm -hmm. um, works this way because he writes from daydreaming. And even Meryl Streep, when I've, I've met her a couple of times, and she did a Q&A once for a doubt that I was, I had the privilege of being there watching her, and she talks about how she creates the character from daydreaming. Mm -hmm. It's very important. It's a way of letting the unconscious come up. Certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a guy who pays attention to little details. Do you still have that pinky ring you wore? No, but I, I, ha I, I probably have it because it was my own, yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't wear it, but I do have the little rose that I wore, the artificial 
flower, the little rosebud, mm -hmm. and I put it in my hair. And I actually was in San Francisco visiting my sister at the time, and they took me to this restaurant right by the water yeah. at the tip of San Francisco. And this woman was older, probably about my age now, but she was older and she had short, curly hair mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, the little um, waitress, you know, cap that they wore. Mm -hmm. And um, and she had a, a, an artificial flower in her hair, and I went, oh my god! And and I wore that in her honor, and I still have that rose. Nice, nice. Yeah, but I I know I do have the ring. I know which one this is. This is amazing, Tommy. That you can you saw that ring. That's amazing. I think it was mm -hmm. the garnet ring that my mother bought me because I was born in. January and the birthstone is garnet, mm -hmm. and I think that was the ring that I was wearing. Wow! Yeah, thought, that's amazing. I thought maybe it was a class ring or something. It looked like one, but um, was it? Did it have a stone in it? Because I did. I was where I did have a class ring from uh, Baldwin. This very um, I academic remember. girl school. I don't remember if it had a stone in it, but I just remember you wearing the ring, though. But um, oh. I love I love when he says, uh, "Come on, Simone, let's talk about your big butt." That's a classic <laughs> moment. <laughs> That's a classic. It was brilliant. It was brilliantly yeah. written. It was just so hilariously written. And the yeah. guy who played Andy, my boyfriend, I met him that day for the first time when we were shooting the exteriors yeah. for um, the dinosaur and the and the diner. And uh, I walked up to him, and he <clears throat> he was really really tall. He's since passed, and yeah. he, I think he was like six nine. You know, he was seven feet. I think seven something. I mean, he was huge and. My head came up to like his waist, yeah. <laughs> and he had this big belly, mm -hmm. and he was in costume. And I patted his belly, and I <laughs> said, "Great, great costume, great padding." And he said, "It's not padding." <laughs> you know, he was whoa. Oh my God! And I made that mistake a couple times uh, with women, you know, where. Mm -hmm. They have a big belly, and I go, when is the baby due? And they say, I'm not pregnant. Oh. So I stopped asking that. But, you know, he didn't take it. He didn't take offense to it, really. I guess I wasn't the first one to tell him that. But he was he was very, very sweet. And Large March, I met that day, that first day. No, the first, very first day I was shooting, it was a bus stop scene. Mm -hmm. where I get off the bus and see him or and then get on the bus and leave and um, au revoir Pee Wee, you know, au revoir Simone. And, and um, I, st I was in the hair and makeup trailer in this location for the bus stop stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really, uh, this woman came on, you know, stepped up into the bus and the whole bus, um, went back and forth, like real, you know? And I thought, mm -hmm. who is this? And this woman had the, had a really foul, like a truck driver's mouth. Just, what the fuck? <laughs> like this. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was large Mars. And she had been given the wrong direction, so she had, couldn't find the place. And she was cursing like a stevedore. I mean, what the fuck? Ah, you know, she really was like large Marge, mm -hmm. <laughs> but her eyes weren't popping out of her head. Yeah, <laughs> she was great. I I thought she was a, she was fantastic in the movie. Yeah, so scary. I mean, kids really got terrified and had nightmares because of when her eyes popped out like that. Oh, I was scared of it. I was scared of the clowns in it. How old were you when you saw Pee Wee's Big Adventure? I was about, about three. Um, we had a re we had a retail oh. store copy of the movie, you know, and we loaned it to a, to a family friend and we never got it back, I remember. But, like, it was on HBO every other day and it was a huge staple of my house. 
I love that you saw it at three. The other scene that terrified children was mm-hmm. the scene with the, 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 the little dinosaur that was alive that was picking up its bike. Oh, that never scared me. He lost it. That never scared me. <laughs> that never did or it did? It, it never did. I, but I did feel bad for Pee Wee, but no, it never scared me. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm glad you, you, this has been a, you know, this has been a childhood um, delight for you to, to see that movie. I, I think it, it's, it's a timeless movie, absolutely timeless, and that you could show it to kids today. It's mm-hmm. just, it's, it's completely iconic. There's nothing like it. I mean, the, 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 that. I, I have a theory about who becomes a star, and the, yeah. the people who really become a star in, in the classic 40s sense, you know, mm-hmm. is, is, is they represent an archetype. And Jerry Lewis was the same, was before Paul Rubens, and he was that same architect, ar- ar- archetype, which is, I'll say that again, Jerry Lewis came before Paul Rubens, and he was the same archetype. Mm-hmm. Um, which is that wild and wacky, crazy, wonderful boy. Right. You know, and it's very funny to see an adult man playing. And Mr. Bean is just, in England is the yeah. same kind of archetype, you know, kind him. of a wacky, wacky boy. Yep, I love you him. You know, who doesn't have the inhibitions of, of an adult. And that archetype, it's, 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 deep in our unconscious, and that's what people crave, is, is to see these archetypes up there on the screen. Mm-hmm. And what you know, and, and he is, and there are not many. There's really only, I think, been in our culture, in, in American films, it's only been Jerry Lewis and Paul Rubin. And, and Jim Varney when he played Ernest, but he's passed now. Jim Varney? I don't know who that is. He played Ernest. Remember Ernest Goes to Camp in all those movies? No, I never saw them. Oh, my God. He was great. You know, he's he's a Southerner who uh, who does, like, all these different jobs, and he always messes them up, especially when he gets cocky ab- about them. But he's very lovable, mm-hmm. though, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was great. He died of lung cancer. Mm. But um, mm. what were those? What were these movies? These movies were called what? Like Ernest goes to camp. Ernest goes to jail. Ernest saves Christmas. <laughs> yeah. I've never even heard of them. Wow. Funny. Oh, you'd love them. What he, period? What period was it? The the eighties and nineties. Hmm. Never heard of them. Fascinating. Oh yeah, you'd you'd love him. He was a very funny man. But um, hmm. what, what were those big dinosaurs, like, supposed to be in the movie? That, that... What do you mean supposed to be? They, they are there. Well, I know that um, they're there, but, like, what, I mean, like, I mean, you can go inside them, but, like, what were they? Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't understand what they were supposed to be, like a shelter or something? I don't, I think they were just, a, they were built uh, as a tourist attraction for, um, out there in the desert nice to get people to stop and and buy things and, and go to that little coffee shop where we shot the you know the, the coffee shop mm-hmm. thing where I'm the waitress mm-hmm. yeah don't you mind them they're just superstitious and I made <laughs> part southern like this because I, I was in the bathroom preparing for the first audition I had two auditions that day for it Mm-hmm. But the first one was um, um, the first audition. I went into the bathroom to prepare, and I saw that this was a waitress. And I thought, you know, I'm so East Coast. Yeah. People even think I'm English. Um, I, they're never going to cast me for this. I better put on an accent. Mm-hmm. That's why I did it, because I thought they're never going to see me as a waitress, because I always get... You know, I came from theater, and I was always the leading lady in theater, and mm-hmm. a lot of the parts were very either aristocratic or, or eccentric. 
And I, I thought that the, the only way I'm going to possibly get cast in this is if I do a Southern accent right. or some kind of accent. So I thought, okay, Southern, because it, I could do it kind of hickey a little bit. Yeah. So that's how I made it Southern. And um, what else were we talking about? I think I went off on a tangent with that. I, I can't remember now. <laughs> You see, the thing I loved about <clears throat> why I love Pee Wee's Big Adventure more than any movie I've ever done, any other movie, is that it, my character Simone talks about, you know, following your dream. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is such a message. I think it's probably the greatest message I've ever given, had the privilege to give through this movie because it's about following your dreams. And you know, as Joseph Campbell said in The Power of, you know, when he was interviewed by Bill Moyers, when Bill Moyers interviewed him for The Power of Myth, he said, you know, follow your bliss and the environment will support you. If you do what you love, you'll be able to make a living doing it. And probably a better living, this is my addition, a better living than doing something that reasonably should make you more money, but that your heart isn't into it. If you don't have heart and passion behind something you do, you're not going to be a success doing it, and you'll be miserable. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be making good money, and you'll be miserable to do. So just do what you love. Right. And that's the message of Simone. And as you wrote me, why I responded to your email, Tommy, was that you were saying how, what a big effect that movie had and that my part had on you because it was about following your dreams. Paul Rubin says, you've got to follow your dreams, Simone. Yep. And I say, oh, I don't know. And, you know, he got me to follow my dream to go to Paris. And it's weird because that's what I do now. I go to, I go to Paris, <laughs> I go to France. To follow my dream right now, which is this novel. Yeah, I, I, I spent half it's my really life. really amazing. Yeah, I spent Go half. Go on, what did you say? I spent half my life, you know, saying, I don't know. And then, you know, I had a pretty bad car accident. And then I said, no, I do know. And that's what I'm doing. I'm following my dream. And it's taking a while because it's show business. But I know I'll, I'll get there. And what's your dream? I, I want to conquer stand-up comedy, acting, screenwriting, all that stuff. Okay, well, that's general. God is in the details, as Mies van der Rohe said. He was a big architect in the 40s in Chicago. Right. And he said, and I say to all my students, God is in the details. God is in the details. You have to make, be it, you know, the universe loves specificity. So... You know, I'm so happy, you can say like the secret, I'm so happy and grateful now that where do you want to be, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of location? Where do you want to be? You, I think it's L.A. You want to come out to L.A.? Absolutely, L.A. Where are you, where are you living now? Um, I just moved uh, to Redding uh, in California, uh, north, uh, a year ago because my mom uh, needed help with the rent. So I came down here. I'm originally from the Bay Area. Okay, well, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump here. It's very different, mm -hmm. but it's a hop, skip, and a, and a jump. And, you know, if you want to be writing as well, you can do that anywhere. So yeah. you start now and write yourself a, a great part. Oh, I've been, I've, been writing, you know? I've been writing for many, many years, and I do have two scripts that I really want to sell that I just wrote recently. Good. Yeah. Good. And, you know, and, and, you know, if you want to do comedy, the quickest way, like Paul started out, you know, he went to the Groundlings and yep. then was doing, uh, and this character, Pee Wee, he told me was only like one of 12 parts. I think he told me this or someone told me. Yeah. One of 12 like roles that he developed. Yeah. And, you know, develop, develop characters, you know, is following Paul's footsteps yeah, in I, some I, ways. <laughs> I've been doing stand-up, I've been doing theater, all that stuff for many years, but I just never, like, 
pursued it because I didn't know the business side of it. But I'll tell you one thing that has educated me on the uh, business side is listening to podcasts and listening how 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 like the like the, like what what goes inside a producer's head and all this stuff about you know you know like when it, when it comes to like you know selling your script or you know getting booked comedy club all that stuff the podcast world has really helped me with that that's great that's great and you know and 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 practice it you know seinfeld practiced his routine Mm-hmm. For uh, Johnny, before he went on Johnny Carson's show, yep. he practiced it a hundred times, the same routine um, it, uh, in front of people. You've just got to get up and start doing it, whether you're wherever you are. And I told a boy this in Morocco who wanted to be a comedian. I said, well, get out there and start start performing. Mm-hmm. And it's so wonderful being a, a, a stand-up comedian. I never had any desire to do that. I think it's one of the, hard, the most. Well, I'm not going to even say that. It's, it's it can be a challenge. It's very it. hard. It, it but, can be. But yeah, you don't have other people's words. You don't have you know the the set, the costumes, other actors. But it you know it is it's a very pure form of that you just you up there facing the audience, and you can do that anywhere. You know, yep. so that's the joy is that you can you can do it in your living room. Yeah, you can do it anywhere, and and just you know practice, 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 and you'll get your seat chops down. Mm-hmm. That's how I started. I started uh, entertaining the family after dinner when I was really little. And that's where, yeah, that's it, it starts began. when you're young, young like that. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, listen, I have to go pretty soon, but so tell me, because um, I've got all these errands to do and then go to the French, the French Film Festival. Um, tell me, are there any other questions you have? Uh, there, there's, so, there's so many I, uh, I want to get into, but uh, we can talk, we can, we can talk um, another time about like The Morning After and Bird and a couple other movies. Well, let's just do it quickly now. Um, Okay. I'm, I'm just really busy, and I, I write a great deal, so I, I, I just want to do it, you know, uh, now. Okay. So, um, ask me questions, okay. The morning after, I mean, it, you have to work with Sidney Lamed. I mean, that must have been a big honor to you. Yes, it was. It was a, it was a huge honor, but it was an, uh, in the beginning, it was a Me Too experience. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Yes, yes, that was my biggest Me Too experience. That and Klaus Kinski. Uh, but anyway, he he was he was brilliant, and um, you know, I, I just I, I just said to him, look, you know, I don't do this kind of thing when when it happened in his hotel room, which my agent set up that I would meet him in his hotel room at the Beverly Hills Hotel, oh, and I and we were to go to dinner, but then he had ordered in. So I just made it really clear, and it was he said it was between me and one other woman who had much more, um, ex, you know, movie and TV experience. Right. And uh, I said, I just don't do this, you know, this, this thing. And I said, I, you know, and, and we kept talking a little, and uh, we talked a long time. He said, it was extremely intelligent, and he then wrote an incredible letter of recommendation for me. Um, years later for a directing program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these men, uh, it's like politicians. It's it's, it's very similar. You know, these men have this power. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I have a friend who's an Indian guru who said that ambition is glorified self-loathing, which is really, uh, I think it's actually very true. Yeah. And these men who have such high, high ambition have underneath it a great self-loathing. Yes. And that it, it, it spurs them. It's the catalyst, you know, the, the propeller for getting them out there and they're becoming such successes. But it doesn't heal this wound. And so this is the way they act out. But um, got, moving on... Um, uh, it was it was a trial by fire that that movie, um, 
and I don't want to go into it too much. Um, not with Sydney, but um, one of the leads. But uh, the the other lead um, I, I just adored, and his name is just Jeff Bridges. He was fantastic, and he would invite me into his trailer um, for lunch every day, along with his body double, who, who was one of his best friends. And right. he told me something really wise, Jeff Bridges did, mm -hmm. that on a set, you pick your friends and you keep them very close to you. So he and I were wow. very close during that um, shoot and he gave, he took this uh, very funny picture of me in the hair and makeup trailer and putting on this Jane Fonda wig because I was supposed to double for Jane Fonda in, in, the, in the actual storyline. And I still have it. He, he's a wonderful photographer and he's a great human being. I'd say mm -hmm. of all the stars I've worked with, he was probably the nicest. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, I love Jeff. So ask me another question. Ask me another question. Did you work at, at all with um, Kathleen Wilhoit? I had her on the show. She's a, a character. I love her. No, never have. Don't know who that is. Yeah, I, 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 she plays Red in the movie. Um, in what movie? In uh, the morning after. I never met her. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Good. Then you got to uh, work with um, Clint Eastwood on Bird. How was that experience? It was it was wonderful because uh, Clint is an actor, and he knows uh, to leave you alone. And he said very very little to me um, when when we were shooting it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he he was really a. Uh, he was wonderful to work with, and Forrest was a, a dream to work mm. with, Forrest Whitaker. Um, and with Clint, along with Sidney Lumet, um, you did, never did more than three takes, maximum. And, mm. you know, the, the scene where I come in and discover in Bird that uh, I played the jazz baroness in it, and, and he, he, all these jazz greats, all the jazz greats would, many of them would come to her to die. Not many, but Charlie Mingus did, I believe, and also mm -hmm. um, Charlie Parker, Bird. And um, Clint, Clint just would tell you, it's kind of like Woody Allen, too, uh, you know, where mm -hmm. Woody leaves you alone except when he doesn't believe something. Yeah. And those are the best kind of directors. And they have enormous, and of course, you yeah. know, I think Sidney Lumet started out as an actor as well. And Woody performs, acts, and they, they leave you alone unless they see something that, that they don't quite believe in. And uh, Clint was great. And what I loved about Clint as well is that his crew had been with him already when I did Bird for 35 years. And um, he's very loyal, and it's it's kind of family. And he treats the actors very well in terms of uh, uh, feeding us. I remember we had uh, like a, it was like a country club eating, <laughs> you know, beautiful <laughs> salmon, poached salmon. And um, anyway, there's more I can tell you, but I uh, I don't really want to talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. About about the about the, the, the but it was a great it was, for the most part it was a fabulous experience working on Bird it was um, you know and I wanted to do the scene another time mm -hmm. and we had we had only shot this the one that one scene once um, but when I discovered that Bird has had this heart attack and has died and he said yeah. nope it tells the story it's good enough. That's the way he was. It was very, very simple. It's like, if it tells the story, it's good enough. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, it was, it was a great experience. Nice. So, so when did you decide you were going to start the uh, Diane Louise Salinger Acting Academy? Um, it, it happened 
how it started, really, initially, the germ of it was uh, the L.A. riots had happened, and I had seen uh, Edward, Olm Eddie Olmos, um, Edward James Olmos, yeah. on uh, television saying, uh, pleading with the, the police, saying, you know, these are kids, please don't hurt them. You've got to remember that a lot of these kids who are rioting are children and you have to, you know, I, I just have, do not harm them. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm going to get out there tomorrow morning with a shovel and trash bags and start cleaning up South Central. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a great idea. So I went and did that myself. And I took an African-American friend who was terrified who had grown up in the Bay Area in a very middle class, upper middle class family and was terrified and I had no fear at all. And um, I was the only white from anywhere I could see. I was the only white person. And um, it, was, it was an incredible experience. Um, the, um, the, the, the men, were really powerful and powerfully strong men, and they were literally lifting up a building, uh, the side of a building, like a wall of a building. Mm -hmm. It was maybe only one story high, but they were lifting it, they had collapsed onto the sidewalk, and they were lifting it up mm -hmm. and pushing it into the interior of the house to clear the way. And the women had their brooms out there, and we had the trash can, the trash bags, and we were sweeping everything up. I, I felt more connected to Los Angeles that, those days, getting into, uh, going into South Central and Compton. And I, mm -hmm. I just was so touched by this. Um, and the, the, the uh, camaraderie and the banning together to clean up South Central was incredible. Mm -hmm. And um, then a friend of mine told me that her husband was part of this project called the Come Together, where they bring together warring gang kids. Mm -hmm. um, and they take them into San Bernardino Mountains. And these kids have never been in nature before, nature, nature. And um, would I want to come and, and be in charge of skits, doing skits? Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely. So I did that, fell in love with the kids, and they were warring kids, you know. They were black, brown, white, uh, and they they hated each other. And this brother Modesto was amazing. Mm -hmm. He was up there, and he told a group of us to go down to the stream and get some water in a, uh, a bowl, which we did, and then he blessed it. And then each one of us had to get up and pick someone whom we either hated in the room, you know, warring gang member, or someone who reminded you of someone, and you stood on either side of the bowl, and you had to wash their hands and dry them, like Mary Magdalene did with Christ, you know, drying his feet with her hair, washing his feet with, and then drying her, his feet. His, his feet with her hair and looking into each other's eyes and saying, I forgive you. It was extraordinary. And I was so moved by this experience that by the end of the weekend, we made this big circle talking about what we had learned there. And I said, look, I've never done this before, but um, anyone interested in, in stunts, hair and makeup, acting, we're going to form a whole workshop for this. Mm -hmm. to get into the business. And then they all put their names, not all, but many of them put their names down and phone numbers. And one guy came up to me named Yogi, mm -hmm. and he kept saying to me, don't forget me, Diane, don't forget me. I said, Yogi, how could I ever forget you? And before I, before I had organized the first... Um, you know, meeting of this acting workshop. It was an acting workshop primarily, but we also were wanting to do skits, you know, stunts and, and hair and makeup for the girls. So I wouldn't exclude anybody. 
mm-hmm. you know, so that it was, but the whole thing was based on acting. And before I had that first um, meeting with all the kids for this workshop, Yogi had been shot and killed in an alleyway because, and he was working for a uh, supermarket and he was putting, taking boxes off a truck and someone came and shot him from a warring gang because he had gone on television and said, love your mother, love your father, get out of gang. And he was shot and killed before the first workshop. Wow. So that's how I started teaching acting. Wow. That's pretty dark. <laughs> and and that's, that's the best, that's probably the best thing I've ever done in my life. And I would say the second best thing I've ever done is, is writing this novel. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Pee Wee's Big Adventure may be the third thing. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I, I, I'm passionate about inspiring people, put it that way. Mm-hmm. You certainly are, Diane, and I sure hope I get to meet you someday. Oh, Tommy, why don't you call me when you get down here? Oh, I would love to. I, I, I certainly would love to. And I have a, I have a big belly you can rub. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say, oh, I love your padding. I won't say that. <laughs> There's no padding there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, honey. All right, dear. Well, keep going with it. Just keep doing it. No judgment. Just write. You know, a friend of mine who is, uh, was the creator of Carnival, which I love being on, and we're still dear friends, Dan Knopf, he said that he, when he is the showrunner for a TV show, like uh, he did um, Dracula, yeah. he gets a, stu- a stick from outside, and he each, each of the writers has to go around the room holding the stupid stick and say whatever comes to their mind, not having... And this, this uh, permits you to say anything without worrying about being called, thought of as stupid. Mm-hmm. And he calls it the stupid stick, and I've used it before uh, improvising for my last Henry Jaglum movie. And I came up with the best stuff, Tommy. Mm-hmm. So pick up a stick and and hold it in your hand, and you could turn the tape recorder on or just write what you think of. No, don't worry about whatever whether you think it's stupid or not. Mm. That's pretty really interesting. It's, it's really brilliant. It's a brilliant way of writing. Pick up a brilliant. stick. Pick up a stick. <laughs> I never thought of that Pick before. Pick up a stick. Stupid stick. The stupid stick. I have a back scratcher I could pick up. <laughs> no, no. Has to be in nature. Stupid st- uh, A stick in nature. No, nothing that has been manipulated by math. <laughs> okay. A stupid stick, okay? A stupid stick. Okay. Yes. All right, Tommy. <laughs> okay. It's been a pleasure, dear. Oh, Diane, it certainly has. Thank you so much. And um, I, I know your novel is just going to be amazing. I'll, I'll contact Thank you. Thank you, darling. I'll contact you when I get out there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Au revoir, Diane. Au revoir, Tommy. Au revoir. <laughs> Bye bye. I just know you're gonna follow your dream, Tommy. I just know you're gonna follow your dream. Au revoir, Tommy. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. Have a great bye. day. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye bye. Well, there you have it, Diane Salinger. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, thank you so much, Diane. You are so insightful and informative and supportive, as well as articulate and just wise, I have to say. For those of you tuning in, I had to skip the intro today due to one of my many difficulties I have on the show, technical difficulties. It got lost on the way to China. Not really, but you get the fucking point. What do you want from me? Um, If you like this video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook, join my Tommy Kovac comedian page, and follow me on Twitter and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on. 
Splat from the past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there is no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. Au revoir.